Okay, everybody can hear me? Nice, thanks for coming. Event sourcing, you're doing it wrong, and I wonder why. Um, we've been building event source systems for a couple of years now. Being a consultant, I know best. So let's get this over, okay? But going down that journey and learning more about, about event sourcing, event-driven systems, CQRS, la, 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 you realize I'm the Jon Snow of event sourcing. And um, basically, I came up with a different title for this talk, namely event sourcing. You are maybe doing parts of it wrong because we made some mistakes along the way, and so will you, I guess. This is difficult because there are no easy, right, wrong answers, only trade-offs. But try to pitch that to a conference. You won't get accepted. So let's settle on this thing. Yeah? Maybe you're doing parts of it wrong. So who am I? Um, that's Düsseldorf, our home stadium uh, from Germany. I'm David. Uh, I work as a principal engineer for Zeneco Technologies, a small consultancy. Basically, I develop stuff hmm? and a couple of times some slides. If you want to reach out, you can find me under König Hotze, basically everywhere. So, uh, but not Facebook, because I don't do that. So keep your hands raised, please. Are you doing already microservices in production, I mean? Yay, let's hear it. Are you also doing domain-driven? Keep your hands <laughs> raised. <laughs> Are you doing domain-driven? Nice. Are you already doing event sourcing? Yeah, a couple of people, nice. And are you using Kafka as the event store? I would seriously love to talk to one of you after the talk, because I see some issues there. So nevertheless, what are we going to talk about? Typical misconceptions. If you look at tutorials, hello world, it's always like you have to do this and that and blah, 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 and nah, you, you don't, actually. I will talk about patterns that we found useful, and as always, this is not snake oil. That worked for us, it might not work for you. There's always, it depends, huh? that's really true. I will talk about some traps you might want to avoid, like framework login or other stuff. And I will compare some things to Kafka. This is not a Kafka rant. I tend to rant sometimes, but Kafka is a wonderful tool. You can use it for many, many things. But I would be cautious to use it for event sourcing. And there are no silver bullets. I will mention some recipes, but as with any other talk here, you have to think for yourself. Given that I am only allowed to talk for 45 minutes and there is lunch afterwards, we're only covering the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg, basically not that circle, but rather, you know, that tiny, whoa, I nearly fell down, the tiny thing up there. If you have questions, reach out afterwards. I will be here for a couple of hours afterwards, so feel free. So let's get started. Before we can talk about event sourcing, we have to lay out the ground, you know, get some wording in order, because vocabulary is kind of difficult. Actually, it's not about event sourcing. Event sourcing is an implementation detail. You need it on your CV to be an awesome developer, of course. But it's actually about realizing that the world is event-driven. There's no such thing as um, an SQL database in the real world. There's no place if I change my name from David to awesome Superman, where there is a, a, a locker with my old name and something changes in there. No, you still remember my previous name and now you remember my new name. So both exist. So that's the reality. Looking at an example, uh, you might know Starbucks or all the other coffee shops. They they work event they work event driven. So if you, for example, order a coffee, after that there is a fact: I have ordered a coffee. A coffee was ordered, and given that fact, somebody else can require payment. So after I pay, there is a new fact in reality, namely order paid. And last but not least, there is a new fact when the coffee is has been prepared by somebody, there is the fact that coffee has been prepared, and so on. The reality is event-driven. So basically, events as facts allow us to basically speak about the dynamics of a system as a first-class entity, as a first-class concept. So no more hidden, if I do this, than this. It's about transaction processed. It's about conference ticket booked. Reality is like that. But reality is boring, and we are developers. So what about technology? Um, I mentioned that I work as a consultant for different companies, also as the architect, whatever that means. And what's the common denominator when we, as architects, talk about systems? It's a square box, obviously. Mm. So everybody wants to do microservices. And then we can ask about how would we actually represent data, and how 
would we represent behavior? How do these microservices communicate? Or do they? I don't know. So then we always start with something like the golden source of truth could be Kafka, for example. And then we publish and subscribe to some events. And we have a local database, maybe, because that's how everybody is doing it. And if you have a CV, you also have a data lake. Who has a data lake? I wonder why. That's the place where information goes to die. <laughs> just, just kidding. Um, and that's where the discussion stops. We have those images, we have those arrows, and the rest is pure magic, right? And that little person will follow us along. That's just the magician. He has always these, these easy answers. So, glossary. An event is a fact. Just think of it as a fact, an unchangeable thing. I'm wearing these, these trousers today. I could wear different trousers, but at this moment, I wore those trousers. It's a fact, cannot change that. I could lie, but that's not a fact. We store events in streams, ordered by time. First, I put on my shoes, then I brushed my hair. I didn't brush them, no, no, they're tangled. And we store them. If we want to store them physically, that's where I speak of an event store. That's basically a database for events. It could be a MongoDB, it could be a Postgres, it could be whatever. I highly recommend you look at Event Store, the open source tool for storing events. It has been built from the ground up for that. And then there's something like, I don't know if you can read the red stuff. It's written, get the current David. Basically a projection. That thing will look at the events and build up what David state was at a certain timestamp. So it's like your bank account. You cannot ask your bank account what is the balance, because it's always the balance at a certain point in time, always. That's how banks work, that's how reality works. If you look at the fridge, you cannot ask the fridge, what are the contents? No, what are the contents now? Do I have some cheese? Maybe tomorrow, not now. And if I want to store those, those things, this David at a certain timestamp, then we are speaking of read models. That's, you know, the, the, the circle with the database in the previous diagram. That's the read model. That's basically all the terms you have to know if you're speaking about event sourcing for now. There are many, many other terms, but for now, that's enough. So what we are going to talk about is we are talking about read models. We'll speak of transactions and eventual con uh, consistency and its impact on Concurrency, maybe, we will see. I said that versions are difficult because we cannot change anything, but maybe we can. We'll speak of errors. And last but not least, our most favorite topic, GDPR and compliance. So first of all, event sourcing and read models. If you start reading on event sourcing, there's always the first thing you read is, you have to have the database to store whatever. It turns out, Maybe you don't. So this, once again, is an example of one of those streams. You can see there are three events, user registered, user onboarded, and user relocated. And if I basically project those, I end up with the user aggregate at a certain point of time. Easy peasy. The issue is, that takes time, right? I have to read all the events, I have to process all the events, so what do we do with those? And the easy answer is always, eh? every microservice has its own database, right? Something tiny like a DB2 or an Oracle. So basically we would have this situation. A user microservice processes some streams, it uses a SQL database or whatever, and that's a representation of something like that. The important part is, for example, that we remember the last event ID and the, the state. And if something new appears, you can see the new event up there, we basically update the content in the last event. Easy. What could go wrong, right? And if I want to get rid of my SQL database because Neo4j, a graph database, is the new shit and really awesome, then I just delete the database and pop, migrate to a different database, right? Well, maybe not. Uh, first of all, the issue is with eventual consistency. You have two databases. You have the event store and you have a SQL store, whatever. You have the Neo4j and the event store. So that's not easy. 
And I just mentioned we throw away the SQL database and just set up the Neo4j. Well, try to do that without downtime. It's uh, kind of hard. And there was this talk about serverless in the other room where we, mentioned, we talked about uh, sending events from A to B and things happen. Well, redeliveries and, and exactly ones are not actually solved. There are ways around it, but they are not easy. You have to do something. And if you are like me, we have customers with an ops team, experts for a certain database. If you keep adding databases to your system, you have to think of operational complexity, role-based access, and, and, and so on and so on. I like to avoid complexity. Complexity keeps me away from my you know, afternoon. Turns out you do not need a read model. And it depends on how we store events. If you look at, for example, Kafka tutorials, you will find something like the user topic, where we basically store the events of users, right? That's what we do, bop, 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 or bank account. And you can see some events from user A, user B, user C, user D, and what have you not. If our system only contains four users, this will work. That, that's the way to go, OK? Don't take me wrong, but my systems have usually more than four users in general, like 50 million something. And that doesn't scale. But what if we create one stream per aggregate? Then you will see we, the streams only contain four events, or five, or ten, and that's the reality. Our streams for our customers, if we design our system correctly, or better, you will find that the streams only contain like dozens of events, maybe 10, maybe 20, maybe 50, but not 50 million. It's just below 100. And the advantage is pretty obvious. If I try, for example, to read user B, then that's all there is to it, basically. I define my handlers, my event handlers. What should happen if user created event is, is seen? What should happen if user onboard event is seen? Blah, blah, blah. And then I read the complete stream from beginning to end all the time. I go to the event store and say, read user B stream from the start of the stream and apply all the handlers. Nothing more. Basically nothing more, actually. You get consistent read for free because there is no second data store. There is no extra database to maintain. And the programming logic, as I told you, there's no framework underneath. It's basically what, what was written, the read events from blah, 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 is basically an HTTP GET. Nothing more. There's no framework in between. But what about speed? This is slow, right? It turns out, no, it's not slow, because event handlers are, in general, mostly getters and setters. And getters and setters is not, you know, CPU intensive. There might be some, some cases where you do actual work on an event, but in general, it's mostly state for shifting from A to B. So mwah, if that is your problem, your system is really efficient, and then let's talk about optimizing that thing. What about queries? If I have a user stream for you, and I have a user stream for you and for myself, how can I find all the adult users, for example? How can I find all users that are adult? In that case, we have projections. I told you before that projections can go to streams and pick out data they want. And it's exactly as that, as, uh, like that. If I wanted to have all the users, I would build up and spin up a projection. It could be even a tiny microservice if I wanted to. And that thing goes through the different streams and basically collects all the data at once. Again, no framework. It's basically just asking the event store, give me all user streams, blop. And you get basically the, the union of all the streams. Keep in mind that handlers are mostly trivial. There are some exemptions, of course, but most handlers, at least in my experience, are trivial. Design your aggregates small. Do not mistake me. I do not mean you have a user stream where all the data of users is stored. No, I mean, really mean user registered, user onboarded, user offboarded. I do not mean put the transactional details of your bank account also in the user stream. The transactions, different stream. And always measure first and only introduce read models if needed. So now we know we have tiny streams. We don't use databases, only if you need to. But what about transactions? Basically, the question is, if I write to such a thing, can I guarantee correctness? Well, what do I mean with that? Uh, by that? I mean that the outcome of a business operation depends on the order of events. Think about baking a cake. If you put the eggs into the oven, 
will be tasty, maybe, I don't know, but you do not get a cake. You have to break those eggs before and put flour in and you have, you know what I mean, a recipe, basically. And in DDD, we say that the aggregate, like the bank account or the user, is responsible for upholding those rules. Like the cake recipe would uphold the rule of first the eggs, then the flour, then the milk, then the oven. An example, once again, a simple example. Let's say we only allow withdrawal of money from our bank account if the bank account holds enough money. That said, banks do not work that way. They love if you overdraw uh, your, your, your account because that's really expensive for you, so don't do that. So let's say we have a bank account and the current account balance is 30 euros. And now we want to withdraw 50 euros. And you have to imagine basically the transactional boundary as a police officer or a police officeress that basically says, nope, not enough money, you're not allowed to enter that stream. We also say that the aggregate is the transactional boundary, basically. It's the same thing you would do actually if you design a Mongo document-based system. It's the same thing, actually. But we have streams, we don't have a Mongo. What can we do? Well, you could introduce a database and use that for transactions. Yeah, maybe not. Maybe if your systems are single-threaded, I know Node.js is not, it's also kind of single-threaded, which it isn't actually, but don't get me wrong. Let's say we have a typical microservice landscape where we have a replication count of two for our account microservice. And both use a single read model for consistency, right? Because that's so awesome. Then the first microservice checks if there is enough money. Yep, there is. And then the second checks, yeah, there is. And then both start to withdraw money at the same time, basically, and then your account goes up in flames and you will be brought to jail or whatever. So if you do validation against a read model as a database, for example, it's prone to inconsistencies. You have to think about locks, like distributed transactions. Who knows OpenXR? Who's old enough to know that thing? Yeah, don't be shy, you're among friends. Use no, I'm just joking. Don't use uh, distributed transactions. Terrible. What we can do is we can introduce a database, an additional database, in front of our processor and use something that's called a single writer. And there's a great blog post from our colleagues at Confluent, Kafka experts, and they basically uh, speak about introducing a couch base in front of something that's called Kafka Connect, and then blah, 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 things happen, magic, everybody's happy, Christmas, and you get a single source of truth. And my recommendation here is if you love your op ops team, ask them, sorry, ask them to install Kafka and Couchbase on AWS. You will find friends for life. They will be busy for six months and um, yeah. Anyways, who's using JPA or Hibernate? And or yeah, a couple, couple of hands. You can go to sleep for two minutes. Optimistic concurrency in control is actually a solution. And the idea here is that in general, multiple things can happen at the same time to your system without interfering with each other. For example, if I'm an accountant and I'm processing your account, I won't be processing your account at the same time. That will be someone else or maybe me later, but not at the same time. It's the same if you go to a, a shop and you have to pay it at, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the cash register. There's only one customer at the time, not the two or 12 customers at the same time. And the idea is, before committing this data, you check that the, the state is still the same, hasn't changed before. And that works with the event store too. So let's talk about the happy path. Once again, we have an account, blah, 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 with a couple of events. And the last event is money deposited with the number five. And we built an aggregate. And the important part is to remember that number. Then we do some business logic and we want to withdraw money from that account. And before adding that event to the stream, we compare those numbers. And if those numbers match up, easy. What about the not so happy path? Same thing. We see the last event was the number four, and we built the aggregate, number four. Remember that event number. But now, in the meantime, some other system has added a number five event. And now, if I want to withdraw money, I can't because number four is not number five, so it's not the latest event. So basically, we reject that event and you have to restart. So the advantage is, once again, 
complexity. If I want to update my account, basically, once again, I read the aggregate from the stream. We remember that is just basically a get. We remember the aggregate. We remember the last event number. We execute the business logic. And when we emit e um, the events, we pass along the last version number. So event store can say, Mwah, your data is not any longer up to date. It's a conflict. Please resolve it yourself. That's optimistic currency control. No magic. What about Kafka? Well, mm, there is this ticket. I've checked it this morning, actually. Kafka 2260. And as somebody pointed out, this would be really handy for creating event source systems. This is basically about whenever you publish, you specify an offset, for example, that you say the last event I expect to be there is 20,260. And yeah, this would enable full-on event sourcing on Kafka without having additional frameworks. But uh, the community seems to disagree. It's still open, it's minor, and they've moved to something else, like uh, effectively once transmissioning and really complex. It's linked in the, tic in the, in the ticket below. Read it. It's interesting, but you won't get offsets in Kafka. Not now. Sorry. So OCC gets you scalability without locks. We don't have to block our whole system just with a single writer or whatever. We can do it locally. You get consistency without databases. It's a design choice. If I, for example, have a stream that just um, picks up signals from a, from a device or whatever, then consistency is no concern. I just append, 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 because losing some signals is basically unimportant. And the programming logic is basically what I show, uh, showed you a couple of minutes ago. It's basically getting and then posting and passing along the version number as a header, for example. Easy, silver bullet, basically. So versioning, um, who loves versions and versioning? API versioning, oh, no, no one. Th a couple of people love uh, API versioning, awesome. The question is, I've been coding since, since my Commodore 64 back in the days, and um, we, don't, we didn't have versions then, but since then, the question is always how to deal with versions without going crazy. And the answer is obviously just use semantic versioning. Who does not know what semantic versioning is? There are a couple of hands. That's basically, if you look at the JAR file, you get the 2.1.3, where the 2 is the major version, and the, the, the middle version is basically the feature level, and the last version is bug fix level. So you expect breaking changes to basically increase the first number. Anyway, as Java developers, let's say uh, we have a producing Microsoft, whatever, and that thing publishes account opened and money deposited events. And to allow reuse, we create classes, and those classes are stored in whatever JAR file with events. And a consumer that consumes those events reuses that thing. Great, that's how we build systems, right? We have an entity jar and everybody uses that entity jar. Works great. But what if we change things? Let's say the producer creates money deposited version 2 and he publishes obviously a new jar file and the consumer still uses the old version and then we go to production and we get an invalid class exception and everything explodes and you get called in on Sunday. Not nice. There's a technique that's called double write. It's actually recommended in some papers. And the idea is basically that we publish the old and the new version of an event. That can work, but the question is always for the consumer whether or not that consumer microservice should process version 1 or wait for a version 2, which might arrive or not. It's not that easy, so you have to find some way around it. You could switch the versioning, but then you have to deal with what about services that don't know version 2 yet. And just think about the implications. You have all these different versions and all the different handlers with logic and whatever, and doesn't work, actually. There's a thing. Who has used the Accent framework? That is, that's a Java native CQRS and event sourcing framework. And they have an upcaster. And the basic idea is that that thing contains logic to map between versions. So you could use the upcaster to automatically convert from v1 to a version 2, and your consumer only sees that version. But as things, things are, is five months later, that thing knows basically the world, and that's job security. So good luck maintaining that thing. I would say something else. If you have to change your event 
in an incompatible way, then that's not a change, that's a new event. If your, your user onboarding requires something completely else, which there are no default values for, which there are no optional values for, then that thing is something else. It's not the original user registration. You have to find a new name. And if you go back to your business people, they will have a new name for that. Maybe that's the new account registration process or the global digital whatever uh, account reg registration process. But there is, in my experience, no such thing as an incompatible change with staying the same, with, with having uh, the, the same name. Doesn't make sense. And I wouldn't use classes. I would always use uh, simple text-based messages. Human readable. Any ideas? Well, basically, JSON. Yeah. Makes me unpopular for the Java crowd, but JSON has one, obviously. And that's a typical e event that you can use, for example. We don't use that exact structure. It's something more complex, but I think you get the idea. You only have to provide the event type, in that case, money transferred, which aggregate it basically belongs to, and some payload. A business person will understand that thing. A business person, no, 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 no computer scientist or whatever, no programmer, can take that thing and she or he, they will understand. And that's what should happen. Your business side should understand your events. But Jason, what about correctness? I mean, there was this IBAN, which obviously is not an IBAN. Well, if don't want to sound awful, but stringly typed really works. It's the best format for, for being super open to the future. It has some drawbacks, obviously, because uh, you have some issues with formats. But that way you are really, because event source systems tend to stay alive a long, long time, and you cannot change data. So if you put data types into your events, you're coupled to those event types forever. You cannot change those anymore. However, what we do is we use something like a weak schema. For example, JSON schema where we basically describe the events and we also give some indication, for example, user ID. It's a string. We believe it's a format of UUID, yeah, maybe. And when sending an, an event, we basically assert that the schema, that the event complies to the schema. That's what we call schema on read, basically. Yeah? The, the client has to basically interpret that event. The client has to deal with what about missing data, what about changing data. That's always to the client. Always. So basically, fixing that with types makes no sense. What about reuse? We love reuse. It's an example for my, for my current project where we have a transaction ledger and a budget planner. The, the idea is that the transa uh, transaction ledger basically is your account, the transactions on your account. And on the right-hand side, you have some visualization. How much did I spend on bottled water? And the important parts are two event types, transaction booked and transaction tagged. And we can just copy data around, right? Because it's so easy. Transaction booked has the account number, an amount, currency, whatever. And the tagged event takes the data it needs and adds a category name, for example, bottled water. Hmm? Basically, we copied those two fields. But down the line, there will be new requirements. Like, hmm, I need the purpose of that transaction also for visibility. We have those data points in the old event, but the, te the tagged event is missing those. There is no purpose field. This is what I call a lossy event. You introduce a new fact, and by introducing that new fact, you lose information. We wouldn't do that with SQL databases, right? If I have two tables and I want to refer to some data from another table, I would use references, right? Mostly. And we do the same thing in event sourcing. We only reference data points by using event and aggregate IDs. In this case, we do not copy the data. We copy the event ID and the transaction ID to the tagged event. Then we introduce something that is called a domain service. The domain service basically reads both kinds of events, zips them like a zipper, you know, merges them into something new. That thing contains everything for the budget planner, basically. And that is a very good candidate for a persistent read model, which you put in the database, because that is a report. It's always eventual consistent. Everybody expects it to be eventual consistent. Nobody writes to that thing. It's just a view. So basically, don't copy parts of an event. Prefer building those, those tiny projections. Projections are no effort. 
they are far easier than anything else. So I refer to accounts, and accounts are actually, like, like with all these transactions, they are not tiny streams. There are many, 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 obviously, transactions on your account per year, at least for, m for myself it's like that. So basically, how do you handle events and event data over a long period of time, 10 years? Because it's append only, it will grow, it will grow, it will grow until the eternity. Actually, you don't. You have heard that. Create a snapshot. Just create a snapshot of your system and things will work out. Well, um, who has a financial department in his or her company? I would have expected every hand to go up, actually. <laughs> well, um, you should go to them. Speak to your accountant. They know event sourcing better than everybody, anybody else on this planet. And there's something that's called a year's end procedure, and everybody knows that thing from, from, from the company. Basically, it's a set of procedures that accountants do to close, basically, the book of a specific year. For example, if you go to your bank and you look at your account data, you won't get all the transactions over the last 20 years all the time, because that's really expensive processing. But you will get the last 100 days, or maybe 120 days, or 200 days, I don't know, it depends on your bank. And that's the same thing that you do with event source systems. Basically, what you do is called copy transform, which I call the event sourcing refactoring power tool, like a giant Hilti, you know, power tool. And it works pretty straightforward. Let's say we have the transaction log of my account from 2017. Let's imagine hundreds of records, thousands of records. And now we have 2018. What we do is we build a snapshot of all the events of a certain period of time. Basically, remember the aggregate, the status of the aggregate at the 1st of January at 0 o'clock. Let's put it that way. Then we deactivate the original stream. We link those up and then we can start working on the new stream. And we don't delete the original stream, never. That data stays. It's offline, basically. Nobody uses it because we can do online processing on the 2018 stream. But if we want to have a multi-year report, we need that data. We can't delete data. And the microservice is basically just waiting for those signals, and then it switches over. To be frank, doing that at, at runtime without any downtime, you know, copying data while data is coming in, it's uh, difficult. You have to think about uh, intermediate uh, message storing and, and puffering or whatever. If you want to do that runtime, come to me afterwards. I can tell you about the details. In general, you want to do that within off time. Just stop your system for a couple of minutes, whatever, and copy the data and then reset it back on. I wouldn't recommend to do that without need at runtime. And it's the same idea if you want to remodel your domain. What I always find at my customers is something like the foo and bar event. And that thing in the middle, and, always indicates, nah, can't be one event. Two things happened. <coughs> Bless you. So there's, for example, here this transferred and booked event. And it's a typical modeling error, actually. So what happens is, once again, we create a new stream, we copy the data over to that target stream, and then we split the event into two. And da-da, you can deactivate and initialize the new stream, and everybody is happy. That said, the devil is in the details. As I said, if you want to know more, get in touch. Dealing with errors, I said that facts are immutable. I cannot change things, obviously. But things happen. Money transferred, amount Euro instead of the, the currency code. And it's a true story. I had that with a system in, in Germany, financial transaction system, where they used as a country code Bavaria. It's like a, a country code Marseille or Provence. It happens only in Bavaria, whatever. Um, and you cannot just update the event. You cannot just go to the database and say update transactions and set currency. Because if I have downstream consumers, They've seen that event, and they will say, Meh, I don't care, why should I reread that thing? Because I've done my, my, my homework. There's something that's called a compensation event. Who has done um, WS web services? There was always this WS compensation event where you just compensate events down the stream. Yeah, they'll maybe, once again, go to your accountant, and you will learn about cancelled and corrected events. 
It's basically something that's called a full compensation. The idea is, is if I transfer money to you and I use the wrong account number, the bank won't just update the account number and process that thing. They will reject it and I have to reapply for a transaction. It's the same thing here. We have that error with the wrong currency code. We cancel that event and we say reason event ID. We remember the event ID and we give some arbitrary reason. And then we reissue the transfer with the current correct amount. And the full compensation the advantage here is that when reading that stream, the compensation is explicit. There's no hidden modification, no side effect. If I read to the streams, I can see my transfer to your account has been cancelled because of. Super easy. So GDPR, compliance and event sourcing. GDPR. Who likes GDPR? Actually, actually, as, as a consumer, you should love that because it gives you the power basically to force Facebook to do... Oh, no, Facebook doesn't care. Yeah, whatever. Um, it's actually called the Regulation of the European Parliament and of the Council of 27th of April 2016 on the Protection of Natural Persons. I will stick to the abbreviation, if, if that's okay. Um, I've read that thing. It's uh, a nice read. The thing I'm focusing on is Article 17, the right to be forgotten, that I can tell my company to throw away my data, my personal data, without undue delay. That's important, undue delay. That doesn't mean right now, it doesn't mean two weeks, it depends on your system. And there's something that's called encryption of streams. Just encrypt your streams and throw away the key. And it works like we have th um, three streams and we create different keys for those streams, encrypt that thing, and if I want to delete my data, I just throw away the key, right? It's super easy. Boom. Problem solved. Well, maybe not. Key administration is still a pain in the neck. I mean, creating keys for 50 million users, different keys, it, it's doable. We are doing that, actually, but it's not fun. And doing that in your code, you know, encrypting and decrypting things all the time, it's also super fun. Then finding what needs to be de deleted in a system where every stream has its own key, so somebody must have a master key to look into everything or use all the keys, it's also challenging. Think about the storage implications. The data is will stay there forever. I cannot defragment because uh, it just is encrypted. Coding complexity I've also already mentioned, but the most important part is dashboard monitoring. If a customer calls and everything is encrypted, then there must be some person that has access to all the keys. Otherwise, I cannot support, really. So that's also a challenge which you have to solve. Actually, it turns out that deletion is pretty awesome. That's why you have a delete command in SQL and a delete command for Mongo and a delete command for everything. Even HTTP has a delete verb. And you can do that with event store 2, basically what's called a tombstone. The idea is when I want to delete user 456, you have to realize that the data for 456 is stored in a stream 456. My data is not in your stream. My data is in my stream. So an example, we have three microservices, user, bank account, and transaction ledger. Basically what we are doing is we delete the stream user and that tombstone is sent to the world. Bank account listens for, has somebody deleted user David? It knows which data belongs to user David. It basically deletes all my data, bank account related, and once again emits a tombstone for other microservices that react to that. So you have a cascade delete basically on events. And it's really that easy. We tell the event store to the delete stream, user 456. It physically deletes that stream and emits those tombstones. Nothing else. No framework, no magic. So, GDPR. But what about dependencies? If I transfer money to your account and I ask the bank, please delete my account, then that transfer data will remain. That, that I have no right to basically delete tra transactional data. It's just illegal. We just anonymize, right? That's what we are doing all the time. Well, there is this RESTL26, which you can bring to your boss, actually, which clearly states just anonymizing things is not okay. You cannot just use my, my username with a, with a static uh, UUID and expect that to be anonymous. You can still trace back to m my original request. So 
If you are doing anonymization, you have to do real anonymization. The thing is, what happens if I delete a Confluence wiki account? Who uses Confluence wikis? So what happens if you delete an account? Is the content gone? Is my, my No, it stays, right? What it does is it replaces your account with an anonymous account, so you can see the changes of that person. And you can do that with event sourcing too. You can say, basically, I do a public-private split. The idea is I have two streams, for, for example, for the user data. We have user public with some arbitrary ID and my favorite color, and my private data, for example, my last name, my given name, and my, um, my license plate. That's not my license plate number. Don't think of any nasty things. So we are able, basically, to keep the public data and we only delete the private data. So when I do something in my system, I can still trace back who was the owning entity, but I cannot trace back to the owning user. You may be able to keep this data, but um, yeah, there are no easy answers. Always with data, go to your lawyer and your CISO. They know best. And go to them at the start of your event sourcing journey, not at, at the end, because then you will be sad. They will just shut you down. So lunch is approaching. I hear the people outside. That's it. Uh, microservice, domain-driven design, event sourcing are a, a big love, basically. You need upfront design. Who is not working in an agile event environment? Well, everybody is doing something agile here. Krass. It's different in Germany, actually. Um, but then you know the, the challenges of doing proper design when you have two weak sprints or whatever. You can refactor, however, you can clean up with those techniques like copy transform. There are not enough in-depth books. Most books out there just focus on arbitrary tool, whatever, but about the, the inherent designs, how to design a system, how to find your aggregates, it's kind of difficult. Hoopla, too fast. Zop, zop, zop. Um, I am building polyglot systems all the time with many, many different programming languages, so I hate frameworks. I prefer libraries, I prefer things that speak HTTP, for example, but if I, for example, want to introduce a Rust microservice for whatever reason, and I have to re-implement whatever framework, I start to cry all the time. And always beware just, I said a couple of times, you have just to do things, always beware of that, because there are always details lacking. Forget this talk, you already did, I guess. Read some papers. That thing is an old uh, Microsoft book. It's still available, it's kind of dated, but it explains the journey from going non-event source, non secrets to a fully event source system, and especially the mistakes they made along the way. It's a great read. You don't have to photograph those slides, by the way. I will tweet them. Um, that book is actually, who knows the um, Eric Evans book on the main driven design? Keep your hands up. Who has finished that? <laughs> couple of kudos. Um, I actually keep that book as a reference if I want to look into details, but for practical advice, I would recommend that book, actually. And there are a couple of papers, as I said, um, I will tweet those later. If you want to get started, whoopla, one key again, my sausage fingers. If, I, if you want to get started with event modeling, you can use that approach. It's really tiny. You will get the idea within 15 minutes from your UI to some events. And you can explain your business people that approach too. They will be able to design your events with you. So go that way. I mentioned choosing the right tool. I recommend Event Store. Um, I'm not a developer, I'm not a vendor. We have great experience with that thing. And um, it's kind of clunky in some areas, especially documentation, but they are working on it and it's open source. If you hate something, well, submit a PR. And it works pretty out of the box. So that said, thank you for your attention. Have a nice conference, and we have three minutes for questions or for lunch. That's up to you. I'm not sad if you go for lunch. So no questions. Thank you.